what's interesting is to uh, look on page 56 of, of the authors of the Psalms. And uh, what uh, is significant uh, is that about of the third of the Psalms have unnamed authors, almost a third of them. Uh, and like Psalm 1 and 2, for example. And, and yet, this is a genre that that does not negate or take away their beauty or their meaning or their significance to us, does it? Uh, other genres, like epistles, for example, like in Hebrews, we don't know who the author is, and we pull our hair over that because that's such a personal uh, genre, and knowing who the author is and knowing who the recipients are would be Im immensely helpful. But as uh, we move away from something like the epistles to something like the Psalms, it, it is not uh, a, a tremendous handicap to not know who the author is. Now, what is helpful is to know who the authors are in terms of background or in terms of kind of personalizing it, and to know that uh, almost half of the Psalms, 73 of them, are written by David. And uh, that was enough to call the whole, uh, the whole book, uh, the whole Psalter, the, the Psalms of David. But uh, he wrote almost half of them. And uh, in fact, uh, other Psalms that do not have his uh, subscription on, his name on, uh, are ascribed to him. For example, uh, Peter says, uh, ascribe Psalm 2 to David. Uh, and it's technically in the unnamed category. So. Um, we don't want to belabor the, the names that are on or not on them, but uh, uh, some of them may have been written, uh, more of them by David, and, and just don't have uh, his name attached to it. Twelve of them are by uh, Asaph, twelve of them by the sons of Korah, two of them are by Solomon, isn't that interesting, 72 and 127. Unless the Lord builds a house, we labor in vain, children are a gift from the Lord, that's a beautiful psalm. One of them, this is one of my favorite names in the Bible. One psalm is by He-Man the Ezraite. Wow, is that a cool name, He-Man the Ezraite. Um, maybe the next son that you have, I, may I just suggest the name He-Man? Just, uh, you know, uh, you'll just shape that child's destiny, you know, his whole arc in life. And uh, he'll probably get beat up all the time at school. <laughs> oh, you think you're a He-Man. I am He-Man. Bam. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, one psalm by Ethan the, the Ezraite. And uh, these uh, are under the sons of Korah. And uh, so perhaps we're involved as uh, Levites with the temple and, and that. Uh, one psalm by Moses, a beautiful, haunting psalm, Psalm 90, and uh, 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 an amazing, uh, just powerful, beautiful psalm. And, and it does help to know that Moses wrote it, and we don't know when he wrote it, but uh, if he wrote it near the end of his life, then uh, it's astonishing to think that he had seen his generation uh, over uh, almost 40 years uh, dying in the wilderness. And uh, that would be uh, about a, a million and a half folks. And if you do the math, a million and a half divided by 40 years divided by 360 days is pretty amazing numbers. Uh, I think it averages something like, well, I don't know, 80 a day something like that. Of course, they didn't all die that, that regularly, but um, there was a constant wail of, of, of death and of loss in Israel from the, those who were adults when they came out of Egypt. And uh, this psalm pictures the brevity of life and uh, the, the effects of sin on that that does shorten our life. Uh, and yet, in the midst of that, or the end of that, that Moses has the audacity to pray give significance to the work of our hands. You know, give something of lasting permanence to the work of our hands, even though our days are, are so short here. So, uh, a rather just astonishing, beautiful, uh, amazing psalm. And uh, then, again, about a third of them are unnamed, although uh, they may actually um, 
in Israel they might have known who they were by tradition, like Psalm 2 being of, uh, by David, but uh, there's no uh, superscription on them to, uh, you know, tell us who they are. So, lots of variety here in, in the authors of the Psalms. Um, what more important to us are the categories of the Psalms on page 57. And uh, these are uh, like knowing what type of a song that uh, you're singing. If, if these were uh, originally poems that were set to music, so they become lyrics of, of songs, both individual songs and uh, a group and corporate songs, that uh, it would help to know the kind of song and music that you would be singing. And uh, obviously uh, there's a lots of different types of songs and music that we sing. Uh, there's a huge difference between a school fight song and a, and a love song, isn't there? <laughs> and, uh, and, and there's as much difference in, in the different kinds of songs and uh, poems that uh, Israel used in her worship too. And so we want to be mindful of that. What is astonishing is uh, apparently the largest category is the category of lament. And that's a song that expresses sadness to the Lord. And there are individual uh, laments and there are group laments. And in this expressing of sadness, they ask God for His help to remedy their situation. Now, there are approximately 60 of these. If you do the math, that's, what, 40% of the Psalms. 40% of the Psalms are sad songs, individual or collective sad songs. Now, um, when was the last time you sang a lament when you were in, with God's people? And do we even know any laments today? <laughs> um, I don't think we have too many laments we sing, do we? We have little parts of songs that might for a moment uh, be uh, lament-like, aren't they? But n not a, a, a whole song. The last Christian song I can remember singing that was a, truly a lament uh, was uh, uh, African-American uh, spiritual. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. See, that's a lament, isn't it? Sad song coming out of the American uh, slavery experience. So, uh, why don't we sing laments, do you think? While you're thinking about that, I want to talk about that. Um, a few years ago, I was uh, consulting with the church, ended up doing it for a couple of years, and uh, early on I met with the music uh, director, and he was kind of tentative, and as he explained, he'd had a kind of a difficult relationship with the, uh, the previous uh, pastor. And uh, he said one of the things the pastor told him as a music uh, director was he said, I don't want you to ever do a song in a minor key. <laughs> I want every song we sing, if it be a choir song or, uh, uh, you know, a, a group song, congregational song, I want it to be in a major key. Now obviously minor key, you can get in, it can be a, a bit more uh, sorrowful and uh, kind of, you know, it, uh, emotive in terms of uh, a, a melancholy or whatever. And uh, this pastor didn't want any of that going on. He wanted everything to be positive, you know, upbeat and in a major key. Now that's a, that an interesting thing. Compare that with 40% approximately the songs that Israel sang were laments. Okay, so how do you, how do you unpack that? What's going on? Pardon? We're the new covenant. Okay, yeah, that takes care of everything, doesn't it? All the sorrow is gone. All the sadness is gone. All the suffering is gone. Huh, really? Okay. Or, or at least we have to redefine it. 
I've got cancer. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's hmm. just really musically ignorant. Pardon? <laughs> That's just really musically ignorant of that uh, Yes, uh, musically ignorant. Uh, but I would say ignorant in terms of life, too, isn't it? Is life positive and upbeat, everything yeah. triumphant? That's a, that's a cultural problem. Okay, it is, isn't it? It's a cultural issue. It's a, and it's a viewpoint of the American Christian Church. It's a cultural issue. It's not Yes. Triumphant, overcoming, always, you know, moving forward in victory and that. So, what happens when uh, September the 11th, uh, 2001 hits and you have uh, the catastrophes of the World Trade Centers, of attacking the Pentagon, and, you know, was it Flight 54 that was tried to be hijacked and all of that? What, what do you do? What do American Christians do? <laughs> they don't know what to do, do they? We don't know what to do. And uh, because life isn't always happy, perky, it's always big picture victorious in Christ, ultimately, isn't it? But there are, are lots of pains and sorrows and losses along the way that God uses to make us like Christ, to transform and conform us to the image of Christ. But those things in and of themselves are not happy and joyful things. Some of them are incredibly grievous and hurtful, aren't they? Um, our greater Ken, um, his father died uh, early in the semester here. And I was just talking to him about that before class. And uh, encouraging him to carve out enough time and space in the midst of grading your papers, in the midst of still taking classes here, some time and space to be able to grieve the loss of his father. And of course the Psalms, 40% of them, uh, would help to give a voice to that, wouldn't they? Occasion to that. And uh, but we're afraid to do that. And so we don't really know what to do with difficult things, painful things. Uh, and others say, well, all things work together for good. So kind of uh, <laughs> the, um, the inappropriate application of it was you need to look at this really as a good thing that happened. You know, your father died. That's ultimately really a good thing. Okay. Um, yes, he was a believer and his last day is his best day. <laughs> Absolutely. But he's, he is with the Lord and I'm still here. There is separation, there is loss, and that is grievous. And we should not deny that and uh, pretend that that doesn't exist. So, here's a helpful article called The Place of Lament in the Christian Life, written by a couple of in insightful authors. I'm going to pass this around. And uh, they show how we got away from singing laments, uh, kind of particularly in Western culture, uh, and uh, that that has been costly to us in terms of knowing what to do with painful things. And, uh, and, and then we're left with kind of having to redefine painful things as something not so painful or kind of put it in a different category. And additionally then, we're hesitant to share it with other believers, aren't we? Because, oh no, the Christian life is victorious and triumphant. And, and it is, it is ultimately, isn't it? Uh, but there's a, a, an emotional cycle of, of loss and pain that we cycle through periodically. And, uh, Paul said to the Thessalonians in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, he said, we grieve, we certainly grieve when, when loved ones die, but not like those with no hope. So we grieve, but there's a, there's a bottom to our grief, isn't it, in, in Christ. Uh, and, and yet we grieve, and, and that's important. And, and these Psalms... Uh, 60 of them at least give us a, a voice to that. And that, that's really important. And I, I think uh, to be 
full-orbed, we, we need to have some of those things that open us up to that. So, uh, and I think a younger generation, you're more open to that. Uh, in part because I think you have a little nitty or grittier view of life than your parents did. Is that fair? Do you sense that? That, I mean, the word of the day for your generation is authentic, right? Not plastic, don't cover things up, but be authentic. And, and uh, the way you dress, a lot of your music uh, is kind of grittier and uh, more... Uh, dealing with uh, uh, difficulties and losses and pains in life and that. And so I, I, think, I think you might be more open to that. Is that a fair, is that a fair description of your generation? Now my dad's 91 and, uh, and he's just been an amazing, amazing person, amazing uh, believer in Christ and um, I followed him for 63 years now, <laughs> and uh, it, it, one of his favorite, uh, his two favorite statements lately, one is, boy, you really have to work hard at growing old gracefully, because there's a lot of demeaning, terrible things that happen to your body, especially when you're 91 years old. Uh, but the second one is, and I think he got this from Robert Schuller. I think, your attitude affects your altitude. Is that a Robert Schuller statement? Your attitude affects your altitude. It sounds, you know, or Norman Vincent Peale, or one of, one of the two of them. Okay. Uh, and, and at first, I, I was kind of repulsed by that a little bit when he started saying that a few years ago. But I thought about it. I thought, there's really truth to that. I mean, that is true. Your attitude is incredibly important. I mean, people with illnesses, like cancer, your attitude, your, uh, you know, hopeful, positive orientation to life actually affects your recovery and your health, doesn't it? It's amazing, the studies that show that, isn't it? Uh, so even bodily, uh, it makes a difference, and certainly emotionally, it makes a difference. But in saying that, there's still room for grief and loss and sorrow. And, and here's the important part about the, the lament psalms, bringing God into that. Even in worship, collectively, bringing God into our losses, our hurt, and our pains, and crying out to Him uh, for His help, His solace, His intervention, perhaps, but just <laughs> saying, God, we're really sad, we're really hurt, we're really wounded, and, and you, you're not outside of that, you are with us in the midst of that. And then, of course, you look at the life of Christ and, 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 and suffering and difficulty was a huge part of his life. And why wouldn't we expect that to be a huge part of our life as his followers? He didn't say, uh, you know, deny yourself and pick up your silver spoon <laughs> and follow me. He said, deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. So you would expect difficulty and persecution and suffering to be a large part of our life. So. Okay, so any, any other things about this, Lament? Any of you musicians, and uh, if you are, I encourage you to uh, write uh, a couple of laments. Now, they kind of have to flow out of, uh, of a place of hurt and pain for them to be real and authentic, but I encourage you to do that. We need to have more of those as God's people. And if we don't, our, our, our faith and our Christianity will be pretty shallow and, and, and brittle in, in the areas of uh, dealing with pain, suffering, loss, um, economic meltdown, <laughs> um, you know, who knows what. So, uh, issues about that. Can you, I don't want to belabor this. Some cultures, like, uh, for example, Russian culture, is a little more naturally melancholy and they're a little more oriented this way. And I think they probably sing a lot more laments, I think they do, than uh, we do in Western culture. So. But beware of always making the Christian life perky, positive, upbeat, uh, and then having to gloss over a lot of the pain and difficulties. Because there are folks, every time we gather as God's people, there's some folks that are in great pain there. Great pain. And uh, I think it would be very appropriate at times to recognize that, certainly to pray for them, 
and then to sing something that is appropriate in, in, in recognizing that. Again, not trying to make everybody depressed, not trying to make everyone melancholy, but it's inviting God into those painful areas of life. And that will add a richness and a depth, I think, to our relationship with the Lord. Much needed one. Any comments on that? Just jump in. We're going to... Was there a time in the church when they did that in the Western culture? Was there a time? Um, uh, there was a, it, that article has an interesting history of the demise of laments. Obviously, uh, carrying over from Judaism, uh, there was a huge number, and from the Old Testament in particular, laments were a huge part of their life. Um, Can you remember as a child, like in the Baptist church growing up, singing songs? That the only lament, like that, the only lament I can ever remember singing is, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, nobody knows but Jesus. That's the only one. I, I don't know of any other laments that were in the hymnal, actually. Yeah. It just has it's dropped out of uh, American Christianity, at least, in most of the forms I'm familiar with. But again, we don't want to think it's inappropriate to, to, to uh, dwell on or think about a sadness and to feel that. We don't want to say, oh gosh, this is, I'm not trusting the Lord. Hmm, really? Are you trusting the Lord if you deny that that's there? <laughs> Is that trust? Isn't it better to acknowledge it and to feel the pain of it and invite God into that and trust Him with that? That seems much healthier to me, doesn't it? And much more holistic. So, well, you get the idea. Second uh, category is uh, declarative praise. Now, it's interesting. There's two kinds of basic kinds of praise uh, songs that were sung. The declarative uh, is that it praises God for a specific deliverance uh, in a situation. You know, David uh, uh, delivered from the hands of Saul or from the hands of the Philistines and that uh, elicits declarative praise. Uh, what do you think, what's the event that would, more than any other event, uh, call forth declarative praise? for the Israelites, their songs. Pardon? The Exodus. the Exodus. The Exodus, yes, the Exodus. Over and over and over. They'll come back to that. That's kind of the plumb line, isn't it? Of deliverance and of God's mighty hand on their behalf. And then, of course, they would add uh, uh, the conquest of the land and that. But uh, more than not, it comes back to the Exodus, O oh Lord, you showed your hand great and mighty to us, and we praise you for that, and that you delivered us out of bondage, out of uh, the hand of Pharaoh and Egypt and all of that. So uh, it's a very specific um, act that calls forth declaring this praise. But then uh, another category, and these are, these are our categories. I, I don't think uh, the Israelites uh, thought, David or any other, the, those who wrote songs, Oh, I'm saying, you know, today I think I'm going to do a descriptive praise song. Yeah, I'm going to do a, one of those psalms. No, these are ours in retrospect, looking back on them and, and describing them and trying to categorize them. So descriptive praise is, by contrast to declarative, it praises God for His great attributes and His mighty deeds in general. So it's a step removed from the specific declarative praise, specific act. It's, it's a step a little more general. And, and lots of different kinds of them. There are royal psalms about kingship, enthronement psalms, songs of Zion, covenant renewal psalms, all of that. Lots of different kinds of descriptive praise psalms. Psalm 8, praising God for how He has revealed Himself in creation to the weak and small and frail, be it infants or be it human beings. <laughs> He who created the heavens or the work of his hands or the work of his fingers. Uh, what is man that you think of him or the son of man? How can you even picture weak, frail, small, seemingly insignificant human beings? And yet you do and you've put all things under our hands on planet earth. And uh, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It's just uh, uh, incredible, isn't it? That's a descriptive praise. And, uh, and so there are a lot in that category. We'll look at, uh, in a moment, we'll look at page uh, 23, kind of how these are 
uh, uh, arranged. Some of them, and we've already encountered them, are didactic psalms or teaching psalms. And they, some of them teach about wisdom. Psalm 1 uh, is a wisdom psalm. Or some of them uh, teach about Torah. Psalm 119, um, 176 verses uh, with a Torah or a synonym for Torah in all but three of those 176 verses. Uh, praising God, thanking Him, uh, but also teaching about the marvelous value of living a life informed by God's uh, instruction, by His law, by Torah. So, uh, wow, these are very different from a lament, aren't they? You know, they're, they are instructive. And, uh, and then the last category would be songs of trust. That uh, perhaps someone is in a difficult situation and uh, maybe they wrote two songs. One was a lament and the other was, oh, Lord, though, I'm, you are trustworthy and I'm going to cling to you. And when the circumstances are bleak and despairing, I will cling to you, I believe in you, I will trust you, and, and that. So uh, really a beautiful, uh, beautiful type of psalm or song or poem, but uh, slightly different. Now again, these are our categories looking descriptively at the Psalter at 150 Psalms and, uh, and, and trying to categorize them as best we can. Now page 23 then, you have uh, these categories, either as major headings of the Psalms and as uh, some of them are uh, uh, subheadings, not uh, all five of these uh, get put up in the, the main headings. Now, here's, here's what I do. And again, my goal is not to dry out <laughs> nor um, make dry and dusty the reading of the Psalms. If there's one part of God's Word that we ought to read with a, a certain amount of uh, emotion, it's the Psalms. And I'm not, I don't want to take that away from you. <laughs> uh, I don't know about you, when, th when you're down or when things are difficult, isn't the Psalms, isn't that usually where you go? That's where I go. Is that where you go? When there's things going on in your life that confuse, hurt, or whatever? Well, here's what I do. Page 23, I made a copy of it. The Psalms are raised by categories by uh, F. Dwayne Lindsay, a longtime faculty member at Dallas Theological Seminary. And uh, I uh, fold it, uh, page uh, 23, and I stick it in the back of my Bible that I read at home in the mornings. And uh, when I'm reading the Psalms, I just pull out page 23 and I quickly look and to see what kind of a psalm it is. First, first I might read the psalm and kind of see if I can, you know, inductively figure it out. Uh, and sometimes I can and sometimes I can't. So, uh, so then I pull this out and, and, uh, and I see where the psalm is. And it starts up at the top with number one and down at the very bottom and down to 150. So it's uh, <coughs> numerically aligned. And so you just look at this on page 23 and you see what kind of a category this is. Uh, and that then gives you a little bit of a head start in, in reading and appreciating the psalm. Uh, for example, today we did a Psalm uh, 103 for today, and that is a descriptive praise psalm. So it's not about a specific deliverance or act of God in history, but it's a more general thing. And it is a hymn proper, and there's about 23 of those. And uh, so that should give you some idea of what kind of a song it is. And so I just find this helpful. Again, I'm talking about taking this out and look at it for 30 seconds, all right? I'm not talking about killing this psalm by categorizing it, but I'm just talking about getting a little more information so you can actually enjoy it a little bit more. And then I go to page 24, which I also keep folded in the back of my Bible. And uh, in light of the category of the Psalms, then it well may have this uh, sort of uh, structure. It might have this structure. Now, uh, there's a lot of variety here. And again, these are descriptively de uh, developed structures as we've looked at these Psalms and see if there's a pattern. But there's a lot of variation. 
within each of these particular uh, categories of psalms. And uh, so this would be the kind of the template of the, you know, of the ideal psalm in this category that would, would have this. And we're going to look at uh, Psalm 103 which is a descriptive praise psalm. That's the one over on the far right hand side. And uh, notice uh, it, its basic structure will be a call to praise. And there's different kinds of calls to praise. Uh, and then they will give the cause for praise. And uh, that has two parts. Usually there's a summary statement of some kind about God's greatness or His grace. And then there will be specific illustrations of why we're praising God in this descriptive praise thing. Now again, this is kind of the classic if it follows this form. And then there'll be a conclusion. So the call to praise, the cause for praise, when obviously the middle one takes up most of the psalm. And then the conclusion, it might be a renewed call to praise or a restatement of the cause for praise or blessings or inst instruction or hallelujah or whatever. There are lots of different kinds of that. Okay? So when we get to Psalm 103, we'll look at that. So I commend this to you just to look at briefly when you get ready to read a psalm or these psalms and uh, just that will give you a little bit of guidelines, kind of certain expectations, what to expect from this psalm or what not to expect. Okay? So I commend that to you. Uh, any just questions or comments about that in terms of Oh, so mellow. Okay, that's all right. Let's look then on page 25 at the messianic implications in the Psalms. And this is, uh, again, like we talked a little bit about last time or so, about types, uh, uh, foreshadowings of Christ uh, in parts of the scriptures, even in the Psalms, there are these uh, uh, foreshadowing or types, or in some cases, uh, uh, directly prophetic statements uh, about Christ. There's only one Psalm that is directly prophetic. So, uh, but there's five different kinds of these. And, uh, and I, I don't know, I find this really a, a fascinating study. So, um, the first category are the, what we call, these are such catchy titles, aren't they? Typico Messianic Psalms. Typico. Why, why not just say, well, I don't know what we'd say. If we said typical, that kind of has a different meaning. So it's typico Messianic. The subject of the psalm is a type of Christ in some feature. Okay, let's look at Psalm 8 real quickly here. Psalm 8, which uh, you read in Playing with Fire, um, is about praising God, the majesty of His name, in that He has displayed His splendor above the heavens in very unexpected ways, hasn't He? He does it through the praise of infants and small babies, children, to cause God's enemies to shut their mouths, to cause them to uh, cease. And then he also does it through astonishingly humble humanity. This uh, uh, um, amazing uh, group of people on this small planet, which is a speck in the universe, isn't it? Uh, and uh, each person, each of us is a speck on a speck. <laughs> And when you stand out uh, at night and look at the starry sky, which you have to get out of the Los Angeles area to do that, so you can see the stars, don't you, a little ways, get away from the lights, look up and see it, uh, and you realize the, the, the unbelievable magnitude uh, of the universe and beyond, and just, oh my goodness, of the heavens. And like David, we would have starry night reverie saying, you know, what in the world are we? We're so little. We are a speck. I am a speck on a speck. God, if just looking at the sky and the heavens, how could you ever, ever think anything of, of, of us as a whole, as a, as a, a humankind, and certainly of any one of us as individuals? How could you do that? 
Well, if you're just left to Starry Night Reverie, you're going to feel pretty small and insignificant, aren't you? And perhaps, as modern uh, scientists said, an, somewhat accidental. <laughs> Uh, but when you look at the revelation and you realize that God has in his kindness has made human, human beings to be kings and queens of the earth <laughs> under the rulership of God and, and, and ultimately through his son, the Messiah. And uh, that casts it in a whole different light, doesn't it? And uh, particularly uh, verses 5 through 8 give this wonderful picture of what is uh, humanity. Uh, we're a little lower than God. You've crowned us with glory and majesty. You've made us to rule human beings, him to rule over the work of their hands. You put all things under his feet, looking at humanity collectively. Uh, all sheep and oxen and also the birds of the field, the, uh, the, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, not to mix those two, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. So an incredible statement about the dignity of, of humanity as a whole and, and God's rulership that he's given us over uh, this planet. And, and, and it is astonishing. Well, uh, okay, the author of Hebrews then in Hebrews 2 picks up on this and, uh, and is going to quote this. So we're now in uh, Hebrews 2, verses uh, 5 through 8. And the author explains, For he, God, did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere, saying, that's kind of how we quote scripture, isn't it? I think, I think it's in the Old Testament, so kind of early on, maybe the first, uh, third, or fourth. Uh, Okay, here's Psalm 2, 5 through 8. What is man that you remember him, and the son of man you are concerned about him, etc., etc.? All right, he goes through all of that. You've put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, Christ, he left nothing that is not subject to him, but now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. And we go, okay, all righty. Wait just a minute. <laughs> Psalm 8 was about all humanity. How can you take this, author of Hebrews, and say, this is about the Messianic Son? How can you say that? Okay, yeah, the Holy Spirit inspires this. Okay, so we assume it's true, and I think it is. But we want to know, how is it true? How, how, what's the connection? The psalmist is talking about humanity and the author of Hebrews says, uh, th this happened uh, with Jesus. What, what's the connection? All right. Let me see how this fits. What happened under the first Adam? Mm. Well, Adam, representative of humanity, was and Eve were given rulership, and yet sin came in and thwarted that and didn't take it away. But as uh, Paul says in Romans 8, uh, not only humanity, but the creation was subjected to futility. Okay, so uh, we have rulership uh, over the creation, God given rulership, but there's a futility in the rulership, and in some sense there's a futility in us because of sin. Both of us have been marred by sin. Ah, along comes the second or the final Adam, right? This is what Paul appeals to in Romans 5. And under his headship now, the new humanity, the humanity in Christ, the, the Humanity that believes in the living God, specifically now through his Son, the new humanity then will experience this designed and desired rulership under the second Adam, which was not experienced for very long under the first Adam. And as the author says, quite insightfully, for in, in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Jesus said, right? Matthew 28. 
but now we do not yet see all things subjected to Him. They are subjected to Him. He is not exercising that authority in uh, an authoritative way, or authoritarian way right now, is He? But it, He can and He will, and uh, under the headship of the second Adam, we, the new humanity, then will reign and rule with Him for a thousand years. And we will experience this, and it will give way to the new heavens and the new earth. So you see how, what the author is thinking of? This is, this is what's going to happen, but we don't yet see it, but it's going to happen. So Psalm 2, speaking of a humanity, humankind, then uh, is, a, is a, t a type uh, of sorts, or, or uh, better, it, is, it carries over, uh, and we will experience that under the new Adam. So it's, it's typical uh, of Christ, when it was uh, literal of, uh, of, of Adam and Eve, wasn't it? The first Adam. But now it becomes a type of the second Adam and the humanity that will flow out of the second Adam. You see how that, how that works? And so it's a type of that. Some aspect of that carries forward and is applicable to Christ. And uh, this is beautiful stuff, beautiful picture. Uh, Psalm 34 uh, talks about no broken bones, that aspect of that refers to the Messiah. Uh, Psalm 41 uh, speaks about a betrayal. Uh, in verse 9 of Psalm 41, referring to Judas. Uh, that's recognized in the New Testament. Psalm uh, 69, verse 9, zeal for thy house will consume thee. That's applied to Jesus. Uh, Psalm 69, verse 21, gall and vinegar. Certain aspects of these uh, Psalms that uh, are types of uh, of the experience uh, of Messiah. Psalm 118, verses 20 to 24, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That gets uh, treated a lot in the New Testament, doesn't it? That's a type of picture of, of Christ. So, so this is just a beautiful stuff, but, but it's kind of built into the structure and the framework uh, of uh, the scriptures. And uh, the, the psalmist quite uh, in a lovely manner bring that out. Isn't that incredible? Uh, in songs that they sang. So there's some significant uh, biblical theological understanding uh, included in these uh, uh, psalms that get carried forward and picked up and developed messianically in the New Testament. Next category are typical prophetic psalms. And again, not everything in the psalm, but something in the psalms uh, psalmist's experience gets described in terms uh, beyond their experience, and only the Messiah can pick that up. Psalm 16 about resurrection, Psalm 22 about the death of Christ, and he shrieks that, the first line of that, uh, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And they didn't have numbers to the psalm, so that's, uh, they knew it by that line, and so, oh, that's, we would say Psalm 22. So. Um, so again, it goes past the experience of the psalmist himself and goes, can only be fulfilled in the Messiah. Some of the psalms are indirectly messianic psalms, and uh, Psalm 2, I think, is a, f a phenomenal example of that, that uh, is applied to Jesus uh, over and over, and uh, most of the psalms in this category are the royal psalms, and there's a bunch of them. Those are listed on uh, page uh, uh, 23. But uh, Psalm 2, 7 through 9, I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as the peoples, as thine inheritance, and the very ends of the earth, as thy possession, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt shatter them like earthenware." So this is a, a royal psalm about the Davidic king, and uh, Peter tells us it was written by David, and um, it pictures universal, absolute rulership by the Davidic king, doesn't it? And so we're, t we're told in the New Testament, and particularly in Acts 13, 30 to 34, Paul says, this was fulfilled, this happened, this came true at the resurrection of Jesus. 
That's when this was fulfilled. He was begotten, enthroned, installed in the Messianic office as the Davidic king. And uh, so this, this sort of thing then shows kind of an indirectly Messianic sort of a thing, again, that goes beyond what uh, would be said of the Davidic kings and ultimately could, will find its fulfillment in, in Christ. So uh, again, Psalm 2, 7 through 9 is a huge one in the New Testament, very crucial sort of a thing. There's only one category of Psalms that is directly, purely Messianic, and that's Psalm 110. Did you know that, here's a little Bible trivia, Psalm 110 verse 1 is the most quoted verse in the New Testament. You'd think normally it would be from something from Isaiah or uh, since Isaiah is the most quoted book, but no, it's Psalm 110 verse 1 is the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. And when you think about it, okay, it makes sense. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. And so the Lord Jesus Christ has been doing that very thing, hasn't he? Sitting at the Father's right hand for 2,000 years, awaiting his return at the Father's will. And in the meantime, he will make his enemies a footstool ultimately for his feet. Interesting uh, imagery, isn't it? The most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. And that, it's kind of unusual, isn't it? Amazing. I had a guy call me on the phone, I don't know, a couple years ago, and he asked me that question. He was testing me. I don't know. So maybe he was wanting to see if he was going to give to Biola or not. So he wanted to see what this uh, Bible prophet did. And uh, actually he had some questions about it, but thought he thought he'd, he'd question me first because he knew the answer and probably he thought there was a good chance I didn't and uh, just happened to know that one. But uh, it, it, it is really amazing how much it is quoted in the, uh, in the uh, New Testament. The last category, and boy, this is a name that you can just drop this one on your friends and they'll just, they'll just be drawn to you, you know like a bees to honey. Say, so, yeah, we were studying today, yeah, the uh, eschatologically Yahwistic Psalms. Now go, wow, that sounds cool. <laughs> eschatologically Yahwistic. Man, that's got a ring to it, doesn't it? That's a secret language we use. Isn't this crazy? <laughs> eschatologically Yahwistic Psalms. <laughs> Holy smokes, these are the uh, enthronement psalms, or a type of this category, Psalms 96 to 99. And again, Yahweh uh, uh, is pictured as the, the ruler, and he will manifest uh, his rulership with, with might. And of course then, uh, uh, through these enthronement psalms, that gets uh, uh, focused on and centralized and fulfilled in the rulership uh, of Messiah uh, over the peoples of the world and, uh, and finds God's reign through Messiah is uh, where the fulfillment comes in these. So five different ways that the Psalms a picture a Messiah. Uh, and again, we don't want to say, oh, this is what the Psalm is about when we exposit it, but we want to be faithful and true to to what the psalm says and how the people understood it. And then as a very appropriate second step, uh, if it fits, we want to see how that uh, there is a, a typological aspect of it or a prophetic aspect or whatever that is fulfilled in Christ, if appropriate in that psalm. So, and there's a lot of psalms that have those features. So any questions about that? I wouldn't necessarily think that this would, you'd experience this in the Psalms, but uh, it, it is amazing that we do, isn't it? Okay, well, what are the Psalms all about? How do they contribute to our spiritual formation? Well, I think the primary contribution, this is in Playing With Fire, is to model what a God-centered view of life is like through the expressions of worship and prayer 
and how believers are to express their deepest needs, pains, concerns to God in passionate prayer and worship. And therefore we ask, what does this psalm tell us about how God's presence and work connects with our deepest concerns and emotions in the midst of difficult or joy, joyous circumstances? It's inviting God into all of the aspects of our life, be they positive or negative, joyful, painful, inviting them in. And, and so it is so instructive as to how these wonderful old covenant believers do that. And quite frankly, they do it a lot better than we do. We can, we need to learn from this. But a, a great example of the, the whole gamut of how God uh, interfaces with and uh, is involved with uh, believers in every aspect of life. And then secondarily, they become models for how we are to worship God. So we ask, what does this psalm tell us about how we should pray, praise, and generally express our heart's desires to God in individual and corporate worship? And they're very instructive, very, very instructive. My concern, and we talked about this when we talked about the existential glasses, is we have so tipped the balance towards uh, expressing our emotions, especially the empty self, that we, we don't quite strike the balance of the Psalms of uh, expressing intense emotions, but, but maintaining a, a God-centered focus. And they are amazing in how they do that, at both end. And I think we would be, should be instructed by that. Not to take away the em emotionality of what we're going through or our pain or any of that, to deeply express that, uh, b but to balance that, as the psalmists do, with uh, God's love, His presence, His faithfulness, and, and all that. So it's, it's an amazing, very dynamic both and as you go through the psalms. And they're, and, and they're fascinating to study in that regard. They really are. Personally, I spent uh, two or three years recently reading through the psalms, uh, five psalms a day and one proverb, and Certainly, I wanted to learn all the things the Psalms had to teach, but one of the additional things I was really looking for is to learn how they express emotions, the, the psalmists. And I, I wanted to be instructed. I don't think I'm very good at that. Uh, how they are feeling things and they express those things to God. And I thought, wow, I want to learn from them. I want to learn from David and all the other psalmists in that. So um, I, I think that's a pretty, pretty cool thing. Questions about this? We're going to turn to Psalm 103 in just a moment, but questions about all of this is such a beautiful part of God's Word, isn't it? <clears throat> and think of how different the Psalms are from the prophets and how different they are from law, Torah, and how different they are from the historical narratives of the Old Testament. And then you s begin to see uh, how each of these genres uh, can be used by the Lord to shape uh, different facets and dimensions of our life. Isn't that, isn't that incredible to think about? And, and that's why we don't want to pull all of these genres through one little keyhole and make them all the same, homogenize them. We don't want to do that. We don't want to distort them. Let's work within the genre boundaries and let the Spirit use the uniquenesses of each genre to shape us and to be more like Christ, individually and especially collectively. That will lead us to become more like Christ, won't it? We'll be more healthy and more balanced. Okay, Psalm 103. What type of a psalm is this? All right, it's a descriptive praise psalm, and it's a hymn proper. It's a category, again, these are our categories. And so we would expect a call to praise of some sort, a cause for praise, summary statement, 
perhaps illustrations, and then a renewed call to praise or some kind of a, a, a ending like that, which gives a, a, a bracketing effect of, of, of some sort, doesn't it? And okay, well, of course I chose Psalm 103 because it fits that pattern as a uh, wonderful uh, descriptive praise psalm. But what do you think is the big idea of this psalm? Those of you who did this uh, particular passage, what's, uh, what's the generic conception? The main statement of this. Those of you, how many of you did this? Let's start there. Okay, a few of you. All right, jump in. What do you think is the big idea of this? All right, someone else. What, uh, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I can call my dentist friend and we can start pulling this out of you like teeth. Yeah, Clinton. That uh, David's praising God for not only personal blessings to him, but also just how he interacts with his people through like grace and love and mercy. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's pretty panoramic, isn't it? And all the blessings, yeah. So you can't just kind of zero it in, even in one little area, can you? It's pretty panoramic. All right, good. Well said. Some others, anything else add to that? <laughs> okay. There's a, there's a contrast with the temple nature of man. Oh, yes. The limitless abilities and mercy of God. Yes, isn't that incredible? In uh, uh, verses 15 to 18, that um, this is what Derek Kidner calls it, and I meant to pass around his commentaries today. I'm sorry, I'll have to bring those next time. Uh, he, he calls it fading life, eternal love in verses 15 through 18. Isn't that beautiful? Verses 15 to 18, Psalm 103, as for man, his days are like grass. Isaiah said that, we are but grass. All flesh is but grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more. It shrivels and dries up down to those dry winds of the Middle East. And its place acknowledges it no longer. Wow. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and who remember his precepts to do them. Wow. Fading life, eternal love. Isn't that a great statement? It just captures that. That's Kid, Derek Kidner's genius in, in his two little commentaries on Psalms. Okay, anything else before we... I want to show you my little attempt to kind of chart this a little bit. Now let me get to that. Uh, I suggest the purpose is to bless the Lord with all that is within us as we recall His astonishing benefits to us. And then it's kind of a long list, isn't it? Of personal care, fatherly compassion, loving kindness, and eternal commitment to us in spite of our brief time on earth. All right, so the call to praise. Notice the call to praise, the cause for praise, and the renewed call for praise. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Why should we bless the Lord? Here's the summary statement, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. That's why we ought to praise Him, because He's given us a lot of benefits, and let's don't forget any of those. And then He just starts listing them, doesn't He? Here are the illustrations of the Lord's benefits. Here are His general ones. Who pardons all your sins, all your iniquities, verse 3. Who heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that the, your youth is renewed like the eagle. Those are some of the astonishingly wonderful general benefits that God gives us. But not only that, and here's Kidner's term again, wayward family, gentle father. Wow. 
Verse 6, The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgment for all who are oppressed. He made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. That's a, a verse, a phrase that gets repeated, doesn't it? He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Oh, my. Is that an astonishing phrase? Oh, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Oh, that gets picked up in the New Covenant, Jeremiah 31, doesn't it? Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. That paragraph is astonishingly beautiful, isn't it? Astonishingly beautiful. And again, Kidner says, wayward family, gentle father. Wow. And then the next section we saw, fading life, eternal love. We're getting a new set of more specific benefits. All right. And it's beautiful and emotive too. All right, now we get to the renewed call to praise. Remember how it started? Praise the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Look what gets added to the praise. The Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and His sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you His angels, oh, mighty in strength, who perform His word, obeying the voice of His word. Bless the Lord, all you His hosts. You who serve Him, doing His will, bless the Lord, all you works of His, in all places of His dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Wow. Mm. He starts with encouraging us to bless the Lord, and then he ends very appropriately and anticipating is that that praise, when we are with the Lord, His presence, we will be joined by the angelic host, the angelic realm. We'll praise Him forever and ever, won't we? Wow. Isn't that spectacular? Uh, it's, it's emotive. I normally cry when I read this, talk about it. It is theologically thoughtful and profound. It is poetic. It is picturesque. Wow, it's got it all, doesn't it? Isn't that a beautiful, incredible balance? All right. Here's a hymn that has been written, a modern hymn on this, and we'll end on this. I don't know this hymn, so I'm not going to sing it to you, but just to head off any requests from the audience. Okay. It's called Praise... Uh, uh, praise my soul, the King of Heaven. Uh, and listen to how uh, the authors uh, work through Psalm 103. This is beautiful. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. To his feet thy tribute bring, ransom, healed, restored, forgiven. Evermore his praises sing. Alleluia, alleluia, praise the everlasting King. Praise him for his grace and favor. See, they're just going through the psalm progressively, aren't they? To our fathers in distress, praise him still the same as ever, slow to chide and swift to bless. Alleluia, alleluia, glorious in his faithfulness. Verse 3, frail as summer's flower we flourish, blows the wind and it is gone. But while mortals rise and perish, God endures unchanging on. Alleluia, alleluia, praise the high eternal one. And then the last one, angels in the height adore him. Ye behold him face to face, saints triumphant bow before him, gathered in from every race. Alleluia, alleluia, praise with us the God of grace. Isn't that beautiful? Takes a psalm and attempts to put it in modern musical dress and words. But it just goes through it. Isn't that beautiful? Great stuff. Great stuff. You know what my prayer is at times that we could start a whole new wave of great Christian music, hymnody, and it's already started. The, particularly there's some British 
uh, folks we've talked about that are doing a great job, but just something this rich that's emotive, theologically sound, memorable, poetic. Wow, life-changing, isn't it? Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.